I'm Nina Olk and I'm going to be sharing my story with you today of how I survived death many a times with regards to gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is a description of when a girl is treated badly because of her gender. My heritage is Indian. I'm born and raised in the United Kingdom a few hours away from London and I was the youngest of, of three children but I was the only girl born into the family. By the age of six I was only allowed to come out of my room when I was called upon to cook or clean. I wasn't allowed to sit with the family to eat, to watch television. I had no verbal communication with anybody. I always went to school a dirty child because I wasn't allowed to wash my own clothes. The teachers didn't pick up on that. Most Asian girls, most African girls, we cower forwards and keep our eyes down, not to make eye contact because that eye contact can aggravate a male to be angry with us. By six, it was just me that was cooking in the kitchen for the whole family. So I was a modern day slave and I remember feeling quite groggy and sleepy one night and I was woken by my mother. She got me up and when I came down the stairs I understood I had to cook and on this particular night I came down the stairs, I prepared the food and then I handed it on a tray to my father through the door and left and my job was then to stay and wait until they'd finished to clear up the plates and then I heard the call. In my language there's a word called Bhutani which means like an evil spirit, a witch, because they believed I was an evil spirit and I had brought bad luck to them being born a girl. As I went into the room my whole body seemed to reject wanting to go in and I talk about that gut feeling that people call and I knew I shouldn't go in but I had I feel no choice and as I walked in with my eyes down my father grabbed my wrist and he threw me onto the table where the dishes fell off the table and the tray and I didn't know what was happening but I knew it was wrong and the first person to rape me was my father and it led to a very long ordeal which was very violent and um, they raped me continuously and I remember not being on the table at one point I was in and out of consciousness a lot of them had disappeared but there was one of my father's friends who stayed who raped me again when I did eventually wake up because I'd passed out there were cuts and bruises all over my body I didn't really understand what had happened but I knew it was wrong and the person that woke me up was my mother she opened the, the door to the room and she slammed it very hard, which startled me. And I looked towards the bottom of the door and saw her feet. And then she did it again. And I remember looking around and thinking, I'm in so much trouble because all the plates are broken. There's food that stained the floor. I was cut in places. I had so many red marks and bruises. And as I said, I was bleeding very, very badly. I was in so much pain. I remember feeling so much pain below. I asked my mother, could I shower? She said, yes. Um, my mother wouldn't let me use the shower, but she would let me use a bucket. And I filled the bucket up with water and washed that way. She told me to clean the floor. And um, I went into the room and managed to get my blood out of the carpet. I remember taking like a, a bucket almost and putting all the broken plates in and washing everything. But whilst that was happening, I was trying not to cry because I never cried really since a child. I was internally, I was just breaking and falling apart. Girls are so disregarded since the day they're born. They're mistreated in so many ways and sexual abuse is more common than we know in cultures such as mine. But people don't speak out about it because of the stigma and taboo systemized around it, but it does exist. So I was pregnant from the night of the rape and having told my mother that my periods had stopped, she called my father. When he came, he was really cross. He was really angry. And he said that I had ruined his life. I had brought shame upon the family. That now he was going to have to sort this problem out. I ended up at a clinic. I remember lying down on like a stretcher type of bed. I remember having gas and air. The next thing I knew, I'm in a, a gown and I'm sitting outside. And it was the first time someone spoke to me with love. The lady, I've said this many times, came out with a cup of tea. She actually handed me the tea, but she stroked my hair. And I remember thinking, God, how bad can I be that she just touched my dirty hair? And she called me love. She's so kind. And I didn't say help me because I didn't know I could ask 
for help. I was still living in this pre-programmed mindset that, that this is the way my life's supposed to be. I had no self-worth. I was young, I was confused and I was really, really broken. I just turned 15 when all of this was happening. I remember driving back from the clinic and my father and mother were both saying the same thing, that she would have been better off dying when she was born. At those days, because I'm born in 1970 there were there were no systems to check what sexual baby was and if the baby was a baby girl they would go to somebody's house like my mother's house and they would put the baby in a plastic bag if it was a girl and suffocate the baby and get rid of it so I in the back of the car this young 15 year old girl decided I would take my own life because everyone would be better off without me wouldn't they nobody seemed to want me not even myself I felt I couldn't even do that right because my parents came upstairs. They noticed I didn't come down when they called me to cook. So they came up and they just beat me. They beat me for trying to kill myself, which confused me because if they didn't want me, why were they doing this? So I thought to myself, maybe they did want me. Maybe they do care. He said that they'd found a solution. I was led into the guest room, which is the same room in which I was raped. And I hadn't really been in there very much since. And, you know, I was fearful. I heard a voice of one of the men that had raped me. And with him was his wife. And they said that we're going to do the engagement now. And I understand I'm going to marry the son of the person that raped me. So I'm marrying the son in a sham wedding. So that when I'm married, I can be a sex servant and a domestic servant for the man that raped me. So this child marriage was arranged. And then came the trade. They exchanged money. They exchanged gold. Old. My father had to give him kitchen um, equipment like washing machines, which were expensive back then. And I was really scared that once I got to my marital home, that I would be gang raped again. And when I had the marriage um, ceremony, there's normally a party. I got to the party where everybody was dancing, and but I was told I had to go home. I was there literally for 10 minutes. I saw the groom. Um, I saw people because I was in a separate room, but I could see people from there. Nobody saw me. And I went home. Um, I was dropped off on my own and I was in the house all alone. And I remember sitting in my room, which was bare. It had always been bare, looking at my books. I was just wondering what was going to come next. And before I knew it, they were back they came to take me to the new home and my mother-in-law told me as soon as I stepped in the door to take off my gold that I was wearing for the ceremony she told me to take off my um, Indian sari that I was wearing because it's very expensive and she gave me a very old Punjabi suit the tunic and the bottoms to put on and then she led me to a room and it was downstairs and it was very small it was literally like a cupboard there was a a small makeshift single bed and opposite was like a, a cupboard that you could put things in. No mirror, nothing, no door. And she said, this is where you'll be. Um, you will just need the kitchen and you will look after us the way you looked after your parents. I was there for four years. Every day I pulled out my father-in-law's hands out of my underwear, pushed him off me. He raped me. He sexually abused me. There was a control-driven adult that bullied me every day. My mother-in-law, when I at first started to plate my own food, would throw my food with the plate into the dustbin and tell me to eat out of the bin. And at first I started to, but then I kind of gave up and I didn't eat anymore. The mistake they made was they were greedy for money. So they asked me to find a job and it was the first time I was exposed to the real world, really. I would walk to work and I found this amazing job and I created a different persona because I needed to earn to please my mother and father-in-law. I started off as a clerical assistant. I managed to get a managerial job by the age of 17, 18. And I made two friends who started noticing that things weren't okay with my appearance because sometimes I would have bruises or bite marks because my father-in-law would bite me a lot whilst raping me. So I started to tell one of the girls because she was from the same culture as me. She had this Nigerian boyfriend from Africa and they both seemed very caring and they seemed concerned. But she said to me, go back home, just don't go to your in-laws just leave and go home just do it your mom and dad will love you because you're 21 now right people say but why would you go home if that's where you were raped and treated so badly from birth but when you have nobody else when you have no 
self-worth and you're quite a naive 21 year old you go to what you know you go back to the place that you know I didn't need them to solve any problems I just needed just some human interaction of a loving kind somebody had seen me get on the bus that was from our community I stood at the door and knocked on it and my father opened the door he grabbed my hair literally forced me into the house but it was the words he was using that I had found myself in the gutter now that I was a prostitute that I was good for nothing that I should have died my mother failed him by birthing a girl my eldest brother was there who's seven years older than me and they both started to beat me and i felt this is not like a normal beating they they were trying to kill me and they kept using the word honor killing that they had to maintain the respect i remember looking forward on the floor and my mother's feet were there and my sister-in-law and they were just standing there and i feverishly looked up you know trying to not make eye contact but I was desperately needing someone to help me and I thought if they see me looking up they may help me but they just were very very angry they had their arms crossed and I do believe at that point I left my body completely because the pain stopped and I remember looking at myself from the outside in saying it's not time yet for you to go and then my brother came and my other brother who said not here and they just stopped and quickly disappeared and I lay there for I say three days but I don't know if I'm being hand on heart honest my mother's friend he opened the door and said they're sending you to India on Sunday I had no idea what day it was but she said Sunday they're sending you to India ask for help at security and she went she just closed the door and disappeared I started to talk to myself it's the only thing I could do and I asked myself the serious question do you want to live or are you, are you ready just to give up? And I don't know why, but I wanted to live. I knew that I wanted to live and I decided I was going. I didn't know where I was going. I thought the people that had tried to help me before from work, they had told me where they lived. So I thought, well, I can find them. They'll help me, won't they? It was my mind that got me to move and I would try and pick myself up on my hands and knees and I couldn't do it. So I was using this part of my um, arms to bring myself up and, and, and shuffle forward. I got to the door, then I had the problem of reaching the handle and I remember trying to reach but this arm was broken and I had a very short window of opportunity in which I could leave but somehow I got out and then I was faced with this six foot high wall which sounds very fictional but it was true and I remember thinking I can't do this I couldn't even stand up and it's really weird because my dog came and sat next to me she looked at me and she looked up to say go I don't know how I did it but I believed I could. And I remember getting over that fence, falling down and collapsing on the other side. And I made it to a taxi rank. And that's where I got some help. One of the drivers turned up, is somebody after you? And I said, yes. He covered me with a blanket and he could have been anyone, but I believe in angels and I believe that angels have crossed my path more than once. And um, I ended up being in hospital for two months, but I ended up making my way to where my friends were because I still had this hope that they would help me and when I got there I learned that my friend she had left but he answered the door but he said look you can stay here but you have to pay me rent I've got two rooms and I said okay thank you I said but I can't work just yet because I'm not really completely well and he said well you know you could owe me but I thought he's another person that's saving me you know giving me a place to stay and I thought only good things of him but I ended up um, going to a party with my friend who would let me stay in his house and I was excited because I'd never been to a party I'd never been invited anywhere and I thought suddenly someone's asking me to go somewhere and as I um, got to this party he was giving me coke to drink which I later discovered wasn't coke it was malady and he got me drunk He'd obviously taken advantage of me and raped me and got me pregnant. But I kind of selfishly wanted something for me. And I gave birth to a daughter. And I really believed I'd changed the cycles of abuse because I celebrated her not understanding the situation I was in with my new partner now. And my daughter was my reason for me wanting to start earning more money than I'd ever seen in my life. And I said to my daughter, I'm going to give you everything I never had. I'm going to love you from the depth of my heart. I will protect you. And I started creating businesses from a spare room because we had three bedrooms, so I had a spare room. And before I knew it, I'd extended this business into a small shop into the town center. We had bought a house, I bought a house, and I had put my partner's name on everything. He wasn't working, I was the only 
bread earner. You know, every weekend he was out drinking, but again, I didn't think it was odd because that's what I knew from a young age, that that's what men do. And we went on then to have a son who was born, um, he's my first son. And he seemed quite happy when my son was born. And I thought, this is going to change our relationship. Things are going to get better. And I started to develop the businesses and I was doing really, really well and looking after my partner. Whilst he's doing what he wants to do, I'm giving him money so he can spend it wherever he wants, not questioning things again. But the violence was starting to escalate. The violence was very mental abusive to start with you know the restriction of money not allowed any friends not allowed to go anywhere it was those sort of restrictions but it became more violent with being pushed down the stairs being punched being kicked um i didn't know what i was doing wrong but i never seemed to do anything right either and um in front of the children i would always smile because i didn't want them to ever remember me crying i guess and then one evening my partner was going out and he wanted more money than i had i didn't have it he was angry my partner pushed me down the stairs and left and I remember lying at the bottom of the stairs unable to get up because I was in a lot of pain. I felt like I felt a foot um, coming out of me. And um, I got to hospital and I gave birth to my third child who died not long after he was born. But he was perfect. And that's when I switched off, I guess, from the world. I was in a maternity ward where babies are crying. But mine wasn't, I don't have anyone with me. And I just remember feeling like I wished it was me that was dead, not him. I um wanted to organise a funeral for my baby, but my partner said I couldn't. And I begged the hospital to help me. So they organised a service. I think it was probably the hardest thing I had to do, I attend my own baby's funeral. And I've been through a lot of trauma, abuse. But when your arms are empty and they long for that child, nothing really fills them. And time went on, the abuse got worse. He would sometimes strangle me to a point where I was sure I was going to die. He would push my head under water as a punishment when the children were at school. I have recordings of him admitting that he set my pillow on fire because he said he was trying to get a message through to me because he was fed up with me. And I remember waking up a second time with my hair was alight because there's a distinctive smell when your hair is on fire. But it was the words that broke me, that I was too fat, I was too ugly, that nobody would want me. He said my children would hate me in the end. This carried on, my daughter went to university. She noticed things were wrong. She started to question him and said, don't treat mummy that way. So his solution to that was to cut me off and not let her have any interaction with us. Snapchat had just come about and I would send her a Snapchat and that was my way of letting her know that I was okay. I had to leave the phone on the table where he could see it. And if he fell asleep, I'd rush and get the phone, run to the bathroom, text her to say I'm fine, delete the message and go put it back. My daughter received a text message and the message said, I'm sorry. And it was a photo of me asleep on the sofa and her brother was slumped on, on a table in a very strange way. Um, like he'd passed out. She ran out of her lecture theatre and made a call to the home. So she woke me up and she said to me, are you okay? And I said, no, my throat feels very um, dry. Just give me a minute. And I'm still on the phone to her and I've gone to the kitchen to get a glass of water. And I see that he's turned all the taps on the stove on and the house is full of gas, just waiting to explode. I somehow pick up my 15 year old son and take him upstairs, not out the house upstairs and I hear the door lock. Every night he would lock the bedroom doors at 11 p.m. and reopen the doors at 5 a.m. And I remember just sitting there holding my son and thinking, what do I do? The sensible thing would be to leave. I had no common sense. And when you're in a relationship where somebody is a narcissistic person and it's domestic violence, you have no idea that you can actually just take the step out of the house yourself. You don't have the strength to ask for help. And asking for help is one of the hardest things that you can do. And it was my son that was brave enough to say at school, I need help. I can't take this anymore. We were removed by social services. The police were involved when the school heard how serious the matter was. We were put into a safe house and I go to the other room and it was the first time after a long time I was with my partner for 23 years 
but I never cried with him. And I let them out that day and I cried and I cried and I cried and I looked down and I remember there was this puddle that I'd created, literally a puddle of tears. And I said, Nina, what are you going to do? Are you going to dance in these tears? Because if you don't, you're going to drown in them. This is what you have to do. I was told because on paper you have all of this money, we can't support you as a government. So you're out on the street. We became homeless. And it was, again, somebody from the school who knew what was going on. And she opened her doors to us and her home and said, look, I want you to live with me. I don't expect anything from you. And I focused on earning money. So I cleaned toilets. I worked for people that um, I used to sell to when I had my own businesses. I started to go and work in their factories doing some packing jobs for two pounds an hour. And by the end of this 30 days, I had enough money to pay for two months up front to um, a landlord that I could find that would rent to me. It was just me and my son there. And instead of things coming together, they weren't. And I didn't ever say to him, are you okay? Because we don't do that. We just talk at our children. We never ask them the questions we need to ask. And my youngest son became very depressed, as did my son that was at boarding school. My son at boarding school was self-harming and I didn't know. And my youngest son ran away. He left a suicide note. He borrowed some money and got to Miami in the hope to buy a gun so he could shoot himself. And I was determined not to lose this child. I've moved away over 400 miles from the area I was born in. And that was probably the best thing that happened in my life, for not just myself, but my whole family, my children. I was no longer looking over my shoulder. I wasn't rushing into a shop and rushing out in case somebody saw me because slowly and slowly I started to discover there's freedom on the other side of fear. I was almost like a child living in an adult's body. And I remember standing when it had been raining and the grass was wet and I connect with mother nature as I call it and I ground and I decided that I got to decide if I was pretty or not, if I was Rapunzel or not. Externally we can do things to ourselves and change our appearance and change our hair and put on makeup and wear jewellery and expensive clothes but if you don't feel it internally nothing on the outside will ever ever give you that real love that you need and I knew from a young child I had done nothing but love others. I was not born into love, but I was love itself. And I decided I would weaponize that love and I would love the fear out of anybody that had fear in them. I would love the fear out of victims. I would love the fear out of survivors who didn't know how to move on with their traumas. And I would do something to change other people's lives because suddenly I was in love and it was my first love. And that love, other than my children's, was for me. My first ever public talk was a TED talk and I did it for my sister because I discovered I had a half sister I'd never knew about. My father had had an extra marital affair. He had abducted um, his six-year-old daughter, his illegitimate daughter, without anybody knowing. I found out after I did the first talk that he had sold her to human traffickers and left her in a place where they harvest organs. And in my TED talk I say, which is titled, Is There Any Honour in Killing? Because the two words just don't go together. He lost respect from everyone by having an extramarital affair and having a daughter and the daughter was still alive. And he was imprisoned, but abduction serves a small sentence. So he came out and when he came out, he was celebrated by the community for doing an honorable thing. So I decided to do this TED talk to ask for change. And I tell my story primarily for her because she's a representation of all of the girls that are out there whose parents let them down, who get let down by social services and governments and police, all the people that are supposed to protect them. I know there are millions and millions of other Ninas living my old life who from one point or another have experienced or are experiencing something that I went through and I don't want that for anyone because when you suffer you really want to help protect everybody else from suffering and that's where I'm at today. If there's anybody out there that's suffering from gender-based violence, be it abuse of a sexual nature or a mental abuse or physical physical abuse know that it's wrong we're taught that we are supposed to live and die for our parents that we have this duty to fulfill for them and that's not true it's not selfish to think about your own life and your own safety i know now 
as I stand in my truth how much I do matter and you all matter out there whether you're female male whoever you are you matter first thing you should do is to talk to somebody speak to a friend charities non-profits like my own we are here to actually serve you and to give you that hand because we will want that person please please ask for help i started my organization um, over a year ago the organization is called endhonorkillings.org and i'm really proud to say that we've helped women and children escape from forced marriages sexual abuse and domestic violence and it's getting bigger because we have more volunteers coming on board. Since I've been speaking out, I have numerous death threats from my family. I speak about human trafficking very openly and by speaking about something, people are educated it and they can actually take steps to help another person. They know the signs, they look out for things. I just want to say thank you for listening to my story. You may have heard a thousand times, but it's true that you can do whatever you put your mind to. I say you deserve to be living your life, not just putting one foot in front of the other every day just to exist. If you need me, I'm sure you'll see the links down below. Um, I am known as London's Life Coach and I will always reach out to you. If you are struggling and you are suffering from any of the traumas that I've mentioned today, please reach out to somebody. Tomorrow doesn't exist, you've only got today and you deserve it. You deserve to get out of that situation today and things will get better. I was homeless six years ago and I'm here now living my life happily with gratitude with my three amazing children. Thank you.